over the years I have been asked many times to do a video on how to paint and I've always resisted this because I don't think I'm a very good miniatures painter. And on the occasions when I've said that people say, well how about you showing us your style? And truth be told, my style is to paint as quickly as possible. So I figured maybe there's something in that. Maybe I could show you how to do army painting. Not that I paint armies, but the, the bottom line is I'm lazy. So here we are in my painting studio. And uh, I figured I'd do a video on how I paint. Yeah. Like most of my crafting videos, this will probably be a complete disaster. So let me show you around my painting studio. Uh, um, so first thing is the shelves of all the unpainted miniatures. There's also this stack of unpainted boxes and clothes bags because this is by the back door. And that's the first point to mention is ventilation is important when painting. So I've got my back door right here and it's locked. That was inconvenient. So this is my painting desk. I've got my painting light back here. The ceiling lights, two of them are pointing directly at the painting table, so I have lots of good light to paint under. I'm going to pick some stuff to paint today. So, um, I've got a few bits here that are finished, just because there's no room anywhere else. Um, and I guess over time this is going to become a painted shelf, I suppose. So, uh, what shall we paint today? Well, uh, I quite fancy doing some Egyptian stuff. And I've got quite a few of uh, this sort of Anubis type stuff. It's from a board game called Myth that I don't actually play, but I do buy them for the minis. Uh, the mini quality on the Myth stuff is, I would say, not as good as something like Bones. It's a little more cartoony, but uh, they do have some really cool stuff, like um, this sort of fish naga thing. And, uh, well, this sort of Anubian... Well, I, I think that's Anubis himself, really. Um, I think, I think I'm getting it right, Anubis, the, 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 the jackal-headed one thing. Anyway, that's what I've decided to paint today. And I'm going to also at the same time, I think, yeah, that's one of them. I think that's a different Egyptian god, I'm not terribly sure. I've also got a sphinx here, I'm going to paint that. Uh, a snake and a naga, and I think I'll do them at the same time. So, let's get set up for stage one. So welcome to the mess and the noise of my kitchen. My dishwasher's died, things are in a pickle, and the washing machine's on, which is really bad for making videos. But this stage uh, is just about cleaning the mold release stuff off the model. So basically, wait, that come in. When these things are being molded, there's, there's like a two-part silicon mold or metal, and uh, probably in this case, actually. And uh, in order to get the plastic out without damaging the model, they use mold release, which is like a spray of oily stuff onto the metal. And uh, that leaves a residue on the model that paint doesn't stick to very well. So what we're going to do is we're going to get some water in this bucket with a small, tiny amount of fairy liquid or, well, no, no, no brand advertising, of washing up liquid that in this case happens to be fairy, but that is no preference to fairy. It just so happens that's what I've got slowly evaporating on my windowsill. I suppose I'm going to have to start using it now my dishwasher's just died. So we just try to ignore all the washing up on the side here. I'm chucking... This is not fairy, this is Tesco's cheap equivalent. So there you go, I'm not advertising fairy, I'm advertising cheap Tesco crap. And I've probably put a bit too much in there, to be honest. It doesn't matter, though. It's not the only stage. Now, for this, I have an old electric toothbrush. Bzzz. So, um, if anyone's ever seen the, the television series Sugar Rush, you know what these are actually for, but in this case, I only use them for cleaning the models. I'm just gonna go splish, and then get the buzzer on, and give it a quick wipe over, try and get in all the details, just to get any of that residue off. And now we're on to step two, which is just to rinse this stuff off, underneath the quickest of rinses. I'm doing the waterfront. There we go. We're just going to get any last trace of this, of the soapy suds off, because we don't want that on there. 
Now, all of those models were absolutely fine, but sometimes with a plastic model, you can get this kind of thing where it's been warped as it came out the mould. Now, that's purely because when it's been moulded, it's very, very hot, and it's been pulled out the mould whilst it's still cooling. And the result of that is there's now a bend in this great saw from a giant miniature. So, let me show you how we fix that. So now I have a bowl of freshly boiled water and some cold water, and the cold water is important. This is the bit I'm going to put back into shape, and I dump that in the hot water. Now this is quite a thick bit of plastic, so I'm just going to let that sit there for about 10-15 seconds to let the heat get right through it and seep into all of the plastic. And then, I'm going to put it out, and now it's pliable, I hold it as straight as I can and I flash cool it. One straight blade. So after the models have been washed and they've also been corrected, they are now soaking wet. And so I've just got to leave them on the side and wait for them to dry. The next part is undercoating. And this is where there's, uh, some people do this in different colors, okay? And it's important to understand those colors and why people choose them. So some people will undercoat in white, some people undercoat in black, and some people undercoat in grey. Occasionally, I'll undercoat in different colours to achieve different effects. If you undercoat in white, your colours on the model will be more bright and vibrant. If you undercoat in black, they'll be duller. Most of the time, I undercoat in grey, because grey has the biggest contrast of light and dark, so I can see what I'm doing better as I'm painting. I'm old, my eyes are fading, you know. <laughs> so grey for me works best. But I do sometimes uh, undercoat different parts of the model in different colours. You should be able to see the bottles on the back there are filled to different levels, particularly it notices quite well on the green one where I put the fill line halfway up. So that was done by a process called pre-shading where I painted the bottom half of the bottle I undercoated in black and the top half of the bottle I undercoated in white. Typically to undercoat I get a kind of spray primer from my local hobby store. Now, it's important here to understand that spray primer is different to ordinary spray paint. If I was to spray a model with, say, this purple colour, or even just grey paint, the resulting model would be tacky to the touch. It would have that kind of stickiness. And then you've got it, if you do do that, uh, and it's an error, but if you do find yourself where you've accidentally used the wrong paint, as I did on my Froggy Moth model here, I just genuinely picked up the wrong paint can and use that by accident because it was a very similar shade you've got to let that dry for several days till all the tackiness is pretty much gone before you then paint the model otherwise these will always be sticky but spray undercoat is only good if you have access to an outside area and uh, you can do it without damaging things you've got to worry about overspray and such and of course you need the weather on your side so sometimes i just undercoat with a regular acrylic gray paint uh, and a fairly large brush and do it by hand. So I'm looking for uh, a mid shade grey, this one here will do. Now in terms of paint, um, <laughs> it's like, I remember when I used to write computer games and whenever I released a game people, one of the first questions people would ask is what did you write it in? Like that just made the game happen and like nothing of what I did mattered, it was all the tool I used. Um, People have the same kind of attitude about paint. It's like, oh, what paint are you using? And if you use this paint, that's wrong, or uh, whatever. Now, there are different qualities of paint. Uh, this is a cheap hobby store paint. This is a Citadel paint, and that is a completely different quality, as is this, which is a Reaper paint. Uh, there are also, uh, quite highly regarded, is uh, Vallejo paints. I don't have any of those, but um, the Reaper paints have a very small uh, granule for the, for the pigmentation, so the pigmentation is, is very, very tiny grains. This allows it to go onto the model much smoother and neater than if you use a hobby store paint. Uh, Citadel, the same, uh, it's a very small uh, granule, but 
over the years I found that quite often Citadel paints are just water. <laughs> like you can buy a Citadel paint sometimes and it's you know a, some tiny pigmentation in the bottom and then the rest of it's just water and it's just rubbish from the get-go and I personally am not a fan. I, there's probably eight people in the comments already going rage, rage, rage. Uh, for me I don't like them. I found the quality of the paint is too variable over the years. You never know if you're getting a good one, and it's very expensive paint. A Reaper paint's a bit more reasonable, but what I don't like about them is the lids. So, a lot of people, uh, when they're painting, they'll use a paint tray like this, well, probably in better condition, to be honest. Um, so, they'll use a mixing tray like this. They'll put the paint in there, and then they work from the painting tray. Uh, that's fine, especially if you're going to mix, but the problem with that is it wastes a lot of paint. I have paints here that have lasted me about 25 years, and they're still going, because I don't waste it. Um, and it's, it's a different thing, when you've got a paint with this sort of style of lid, and a lot of them come in this style, uh, I, I use, especially on the metals, I, I use these Tamiya paints, which again is a higher quality paint, although they they've got some kind of oil in them that makes them smell terrible. Um, so I'll use quite often, most of my paints are, are cheap hobby store paints, um, even though the granules are larger and the paint doesn't go on as smoothly, I find that I can work with that effect to, to actually enhance the model. So I'm going to undercoat this one with a slight grey, it's a, a medium grey, and I'm getting quite a large brush for this now because this is just an undercoat. And it doesn't matter if this goes on smoothly at all, because what I'm doing here is I'm purely putting a surface down on the model that other paints will be will stick to easier. Uh, so you could say, well, why don't you just go straight with the colour you want? Well, um, you you basically want a, a, an evenish coat of paint all over the model that your detail paint will then stick to, or your base colour uh, level will stick to. It just, when you undercoat a model, it will be better than when you don't. It's as simple as that, especially if you're working with pewter. Uh, now, I know the people who behind the bones models have, have said, I just dropped the model. Reaper miniatures who make this say you don't need to undercoat these. I prefer to do so anyway. Um, just because it's easier to see if things are grey, you know, it, it's just the detail uh, stands out much more. So uh, make sure you don't leave any blobs behind, no air bubbles, you're just getting a smooth cover of paint all over. And that is it, job done. I just need to wait for that to dry. It's acrylic paint, doesn't take long. Now, some people use oil paints, and I hate that. You see, ignore miniature painting for a moment and think about canvas, artists on canvas. You've got your watercolor, which is your acrylics, and you've got your oil. Now, if you notice, your oil paintings are textured. They're, they have a, a texture to it because of the thickness of the paint. You can create, uh, you can make light interact with the surface of the canvas in a way you can't with watercolour because of the shape of the paint on the canvas. Oil paint is thick. It is designed for putting texture on a surface. Well, when you're painting a sculpture, a miniature, you've already got the texture you're after. You just want to colour that texture. You, you don't want to be adding texture to it. So oil paints, in my view, just aren't suitable for model painting. That's not the right tool for the job. The oil stinks, you've got to use thinners, which is smelly and disgusting, your brushes get clogged up, and it's just a horrible, horrible medium to work in when you're painting miniatures. Miniatures, in my view, should be painted in acrylic. So my little dude here now is undercoated. I'm gonna leave that. Um, actually, I'll probably leave it until tomorrow when I undercoat the rest, and I'll show you how to spray undercoat if I've got any spray paint left. We'll see. Day two, and we're ready to undercoat. Now, uh, pro tip, if you failed to defend your tennis title the day before and lost in a tennis tournament, your body is going to hurt, and every movement you do will be painful and slow. That might be more relevant to me right now than you, but so, day two, let's get spraying. The first thing I'm going to do is remove things that might be an obstruction. Now, I always keep a few big boxes around in my garage to use as a spray mat. B 
be mindful of the gaps in your carport between any leaves. Try not to spray your patio if uh, possible. Do it over grass because at least grass grows and gets cut and then you can remove any overspray from your garden. Now, when laying out your models, I always try to do a sort of 45 degree angle. So as you see, I've considered the angle attack of the spray as it goes in to try and get good coverage and not waste any. And here I'm considering how to capture the overspray just to make sure, you know, that I'm not wasting my paint. These ones are going to cause me a problem because I'm going to have to spray them from underneath. So again, be mindful of spraying things in the immediate area that you don't want to ruin. It's empty. A friend gave me an old tin of this. I've not used it. It's a white undercoat, but I'll we'll have to do. Fresh can. And I've always held off using this one because um, I have no idea if it is it black primer or is it grey. Um, it seems to be both according to the colour coding this manufacturer normally uses. So I guess I'll find out. Turns out it's black. Not my favourite primer, but hey ho. So, you know, one day too, we've not even started painting yet. These are going to be, well, it's quite sunny out, so they probably won't take that long. Most of them are catching the sun, so yay. Um, I do have a pet, right? I have a cat. So I prefer not to bring the models in too soon. Uh, if need be, I'll, I'll chuck them in the garage overnight, but I've never had to do that yet. Um, because they will smell a little bit. Uh, you know, from the fumes, from the, the primer, whilst it's setting. Um, that's obviously not very nice for a, a cat. She won't go outside now, now that's in the garden. She'll be like, I'm trapped inside in my little fortress. So unfair. Why do you do this to me, Mummy? So things to consider when spraying is wind, obviously. Um, the distance you spray at is quite important. You don't want to get the paint on too thick because uh, you don't want to lose any details. This isn't about complete coverage. This is about getting a surface on the model that the rest of your paint will smoothly stick to. So yes, you want, uh, in the perfect world, a, a single micron of coverage, but of course that's not possible. Um, so, th but that's what you're aiming for. So you, you want to cover the model, but don't saturate the model. And that's what you're looking for in terms of distance. And you're just going to have to react to the wind. I often find I feel that I'm spraying too close, I probably am, but when I do it further away the wind just takes the spray and it doesn't cover the thing I'm trying to spray. So uh, you, you do end up spraying fairly close, but do it in short bursts. Don't, don't stay on the same model too long, keep the can moving so that you're always, uh, well, you're never saturating too much and then you get a chance to see what it's like and then decide if you're going to spray some more. Um, so yeah, that's it. You know, as you saw, I went from four angles. I had the model at a kind of 45 degree facing, so that I had a good, uh, you know, good good angle of attack into the model, so that I could get all the different angles. And we're ready to begin painting. So uh, I like to start with the biggest creatures first, especially when you get a set like this that you've got the same design elements following through the big ones to the mediums to the smallest, because. If you paint the small ones first, you come up with a colour scheme and then you do it on the big one and you can't always follow the colour scheme through because the big ones have more elements. So I'm going to start with this one. Now it comes pre-assembled, which is going to make some of this quite difficult to reach. I always hate it when model manufacturers do that. Uh, and I'm actually wondering, this couldn't have been one bit. How on earth did they do that? I can't see a join. Maybe that is a join on the arm. Yeah, I think it's on the arms. But I'm not going to break that off. Uh, so, time to begin painting. 
Now, I like to start with the most recessed areas first. So the reason I like to start with the recessed areas is, uh, let's say that I paint the inside of this ear pink. Then I paint the outside of the ear. That's easy enough, right? But if I was to do the outside first, as I then try to do the inside, I could very easily paint over the outside of the ear. So by starting with the most recessed areas, we're making it easy later on, because what, what we don't want to do is to put our brush past anything and then overpaint because the brush is a little bit too big or we're just not that accurate or something. So I'm going to use the Reaper Pink for this. I'm going to use this in an age. Oh, there we go, a tiny little blob which you can't see because it's off camera. Isn't that convenient? And then I'm just going to get it on camera, there we go. I'm just going to paint the inside of the ears. I'm actually not so sure this was a right choice of brush now. It feels a little bit too big. Right, and I may as well just go on and do the rest of the models all the same. Now quite often when doing the most recessed areas first, for most models that usually means starting somewhere around the face or doing the face base colour and then working out from there because uh, generally speaking models usually wear armour of some description or clothing and it's the, the flesh tones that are underneath that clothing so uh, generally speaking you want to be looking at the face of the model and seeing what's the most recessed part of that in terms of colour obviously these got ears that are quite noticeable and um, you know I want pink but if it was a humanoid model I'd probably be doing the flesh tones first one thing I tend to do when I'm painting is any colour that I use I tend to leave in a pile near the models I'm painting this way I know that's the colour I've used in this set now for a lot of people that I know that won't matter but as your paint collection grows it can become harder to know exactly which shades you've used now if you're doing colour mixes on a big batch of models like this, that would be problematical, especially if you need to go back and correct a mistake from earlier. So rather than use mixes, I like to use an actual shade that's just close to the one I want. So now that I've done his ears, I'm just looking at the rest of the face and deciding what colours I'm going to paint it. Now, the thing about when choosing colours for a model is I generally run the principle that if I want this to be a, a nice looking model on the table, and in the case of this big guy I do, that any excuse you can find to put another colour in is worth taking. Like, rather than paint things the same colours as their surroundings, and I, I know a lot of wargamers will tend to just paint a model one colour and then use a bit of dry brush and ink wash or something, and to be honest it looks terrible. If there's an opportunity to put another colour down, take it because even if you don't paint it that well the vibrancy of the model will really show up be adventurous with your color choices when i do dungeon scenery for example i know a lot of people tend to do their dungeons and caverns as gray which is a very kind of neutral color i do have a gray dungeon but it isn't the first one i made um i went for yellow first of all and thought sandstone bricks because it adds a little more story and a little more personality into that environment. And it's the same with miniatures. The more colours there are, the more personality will come through in the final piece. Looking at the face on this big guy, I think the thing I want to do next is the teeth, because it's going to be very hard to paint them afterwards. So um, the eyes I'll do uh, afterwards but the, the teeth will be hard to get in. So let's go and do that. And the colour I'm going to choose for that is a really, really, really pure white. This is snow titanium white. And this time I'm only using a hobby paint. There's a couple of reasons why I would do this in a hobby paint. First of all, the area in question is a small area. Therefore, using a paint that over a larger area, hobby paint, you tend to notice more of a... Uh, a less solid uh, coverage when, when you paint with it. Um, but also, because you know, it's a small area, that's not going to matter. Um, but I, I tend to use hobby paints because, again, I like to have uh, lots of colours and it's just more affordable. 
Um, as I mentioned before, there are ways to achieve good effects with hobby paint. You don't necessarily need the expensive paints unless you're doing, you know, real high quality stuff. I can't actually see his mouth running up. There it is. It's a little tricky to see the definition of the lines. And this is one of the problem with the the myth models is they they are a little lower detail. They they're kind of more cartoony in their uh, aesthetic. Ah, oh, that that's a disaster okay but this this is what I mean when I say like paint the most recessed area first because that'll correct itself when I go and do the flesh tone later um, which in this case would be a, a nice black however one point to note when uh, you are sort of painting and you're, you're making a bit of mess and going it's okay I'll go over it later is you really do need to know your paints because whilst yes a, a mistake can you know, always be fixed but you know, there'll often be a bit that's visible as a consequence of the mistake being made. Know your paint. So, I know that I'm going to do this flesh tone in black. The black is a thick, uh, relatively even paint, and it will cover up that white well. But if I was using something like a light blue, light blues, uh, blue colouring is actually a, a very hard colouring to make, uh, and it tends not to go on as evenly as the black. And uh, especially with the, the lighter colours, uh, other than yellow, yellow is pretty thick, but the the way you, you apply blue, if these were going to have blue flesh, that white would show through, and that would not look as good. So, uh, now to choose what colour to paint next, I think I'm going to do his head. What should I do? Yeah, definitely, uh, it would be easier to do this neck before doing this back plate of this head design thing. So let's do that. Let's get my black. And yes, I am painting the black over the undercoat. Um, several reasons for that. Uh, firstly, it allows me to fix errors. I can't reapply undercoat. This black will be slightly different to the undercoat. Uh, it's going to be a bit darker than that primer. So, um, you know, painting and um, you know with the with the the colour that I would correct with allows me to hide those mistakes, particularly uh, as I was a little bit careless around the mouth when I was painting the teeth. But now that is just going to cover that off and barely be noticeable. Now, one thing to note is you should always use the appropriate brush. Don't soldier on with a brush that's too big but it happens to be the one you're holding. Um, always get the right brush and you know I, I admit like everyone else I'm a little bit lazy sometimes and I don't change brush and so often I regret it because I, I go and paint a bit and I, go, I couldn't get the detail that I was hoping I could just sort of quickly paint uh, and you know it all goes terribly wrong and I'm like no regrets so yeah always use the right size brush don't don't skimp on changing brush um, and I say that knowing that you will at some point do it, just as I do, and um, it'll be a disaster. So yay. Yay for the human condition. Okay. So stroke angle matters. So you see what I'm doing is I'm painting into the ear at an angle with the brush, sort of, uh, where, where it basically cannot go into the pink. So, uh, you know, in, into the centre of the ear. So I'm, I'm being, I've got no choice here, I've got to go in forward, but actually I could probably do it in this angle, there we go. So yes, be mindful of your angle of attack as you apply the paint, so as not to spoil an area that you, you don't want to ruin. Um, in this case, you know, I really didn't want the pink getting into the ear, so I pulled in from the side, yeah, to coming back, uh, pu pulling back and across the ear and that prevented the brush from getting anywhere I wouldn't want the paint to go. That really is, you know, most of painting is choosing your angle of attack. It's such an important point to get right because you don't, you know, it, it's not about having a steady hand sometimes. Sometimes it's just about using the paintbrush in the correct direction so that you don't need a steady hand. 
Now I've now done several models and what's beginning to happen is this black paint I've been using for a while is beginning to dry on the brush. Not the paint I've just put on, but the stuff in the core of the brush. This is bad for the long-term health of the brush. So every now and then, when I've been painting with the same colour for a little while, I just give the brush a quick clean, dry it off, and then start again. Just, just to stop the paint in the inside from drying over the bristles and making the brush that little less bit flexible. Pro tip, always take a break when you want to have a drink. And come away from the painting table. Otherwise, one day, you'll have a paintbrush in here and paint water in your throat. One of the things that I like about hobby paint is that you can work from the lid. Uh, so you don't need to constantly be wasting paint in a mixing tray. So uh, just like any other paint, you shake first. And now I've got lots of paint in the lid that I can just work off. So I apply it to the brush scrape some off on the edge and get to painting. Now, over time, this can result in a build-up of painting on the lid. So what you do is you use that paint that you've scraped off on previous strokes to keep the paint down that's on the lip. And every now and then, with, with a pot of paint, what I might do is just peel away any paint that's sort of dried up around the edge but um, this this approach means I'm not constantly using a mixing tray and um, it's just really really convenient and um, uh, it's something you can do with a lot of different makes of paint but this the Reaper style of pot that requires you to uh, you know just doesn't have that kind of a lid and it's sort of like a you know squeeze it out you can't do it with those um, which is why I, I don't use Reaper or Vallejo that often because um, otherwise, you know, you, you just end up wasting most of your good paint. So, uh, and that's why I, I sometimes use the Tamiya paints, particularly for the metallics. It's, it's just, they're, they're a better designed pot, if I can find them. There we go. So, you know, this is a Tamiya. Now, if you can hear me at all over the washing machine, and I hope you can, it is often said that art is knowing what the stakes to keep. And you see here, I made an error on this ear and I've got a little bit of black coming into it and well I figure that that to me it just looks like it's a hair, a stray hair, you know this particular dog has furry ears and I'm okay with that I'm gonna let that mistake slide um, also because I'm lazy but sometimes you make a mistake and it, and it looks really good and if it does keep it I remember some statues I painted once with this um, accidental marble effect and it looked fantastic but um, what I did was I, I carried on doing what I always do or, or always did back then which was to do some dry brushing and some ink brushing and ended up ruining the marble effect and I should have kept it I should have gone wow I, I didn't intend this but it's better than what I got planned and I have huge regrets over those particular statue models because they had looked so much better before I went to do what I would normally have considered just finishing them off. Classic example, I've messed up and I've got some black uh, into the an area of the ear where I, I didn't intend for it to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flick up with the brush, get that black as part of the, the, the ear. And now, yeah, it's a bit of hair in the ear, big deal. Another thing I'll sometimes do is take paint directly from the pot, but when you do that, you tend to get quite a lot of the brush. So again, I'll just wipe some on the edge to thin it out. Now, zoom in close on these guys, because um, I, I don't know how well this will show up for you, but now what some people do is they paint their base color all over the model and then paint the details on. I don't like doing that, but there are times with details like this necklace, it would just take too long to try and you know, get get between the necklace. So I'm just going to go over the whole thing, and then when it's dry, I'll go over again. But I'm still going to avoid areas I don't want in this colour, um, and my brush is starting to clog up 
So once we've done the base colour and we've put some details on, or as I like to call it, the, the detail stage, which is purely when you go over with a finer brush to uh, try and you know add, add some little details onto it. What we do next is the dry brushing stage, and that's where we take something like this and turn it into something like this. The first part of dry brushing is to pick the right colour. We're only going to do this on the darker parts of the model. Um, if I'm doing like a unit of, of like 20, 30 models or something, I'll just take a white or an off-white colour and I'll do the whole thing in one colour. But for a feature piece, I like to build the layers of dry brushing up. So I've got here, um, this is this wing is painted in a, a red that goes on in a particularly uneven manner. I chose that deliberately. It's a, uh, a dark scarlet and it, it tends to sort of form darker patches and lighter patches. Hopefully that's coming up. Now that, that's good. That was a deliberate choice of colour. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm getting a flesh colour, which is like a, a lighter red. And I've, I've covered, I've saturated the brush, even the edges of the brush, in paint and then wiped it all off. So my whole brush is now a painting surface, not just the tip. But I've taken the paint out and what I'm going to do is just rub over it. So to start off with getting paint all over my brush, remove as much as I can on the lid and then using my rough paper I'm just wiping off all the excess paint so now my brush is dry, is it? I'm not on camera, there we go, my brush is dry but it has some residual paint and then just going to rub that over the model and I'm allowing the sculpture to do the work of painting for me so that I'm not actually applying paint in any kind of meaningful or controlled manner because the sculpture of the model is doing the work. Now when it comes to dry brushing you really want to be using a round brush. If you're anything like me you'll have quite a lot of flat brushes because I, I prefer to paint um, you know, detail work with a flatter brush. But when it comes to dry brushing you want big round brushes. And you know, big brushes are, are perfect for this because you, you can do dry brushing very quickly and cover a large area very quickly. This isn't detail work, it's picking out the detail that the sculpture has put in for you and making use of it. Do bear in mind that brush that gets used for dry brushing will wear out much faster. So you really, you know, don't use your favourite brush, get a cheap hobby brush, um, you know, one that you don't, you don't mind if it gets ruined because it'll get ruined. Now that I've finished dry brushing the red parts of this model, I'm going to start on the black parts and because I'm doing a multi-layer dry brush in this case, I'm going to change colour. So the flesh colour no longer good when I'm doing black. What I need now is a grey. So I'm going to wash this brush off. Now here's the important thing. I now cannot use this brush for dry brushing until it gets dry. So I've got to move on to another brush. Always use a dry brush for this. It's called dry brushing for very good reason. If there's any moisture on this, the paint will flow and, and run into the cracks. And you don't want that. What you're doing is you're highlighting the extrusions in the model. You don't want the paint flowing into the depth. Now, darker colours always dry brush better but we're still going to dry brush the lightly coloured areas. We're just going to go straight to the bright white on those. And now that I've finished the lighter coloured parts, I'm going to go back to the darker coloured parts, the red and the black in this case, and I'm just going to go over again now with the white over the top of the flesh colour. But this time I'm being careful not to put as much on. I 
you know, we've already got one layer of highlight, we don't want to eliminate that layer, we're kind of touching up that layer instead of touching up the base colour. So just very lightly. Just bringing out the very tip of the highlights. Not doing any area too much because, you know, we want to layer these highlights. The second from last stage is the ink wash. Now, if you're at the level where you're using different coloured ink washes and you've watched this far into a video about me teaching to paint, then you're mad because that's a whole other level. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, black ink wash all over the model. And um, here's the thing. A lot of people go out and buy expensive ink washes, and I don't know if you realise this, but you're using acrylic paint. It, an ink wash is mostly water. Like, almost all of it is water. <laughs> you can make it yourself using acrylic paint, so I just use some black paint and some water. But before I do it, this model has to get bone dry. Any moisture on these models, and the, the paint will just pick up that moisture and flow. So we've got to wait for it to dry. It won't take long. Dry brushing just takes a few minutes. Uh, I did a few touch-up bits, so yeah, I have to wait for them. And in the meantime, I'm going to have to clear out a lot of space on my painting table, because ink washes takes space. Now, when you're ink washing something like this, little bits of paint will flick, so be careful what's in your work area. When you're ink washing, Something like this, little flicks of wet paint could go quite a distance. So make sure you protect your work area. Cheers, Santa Claus. Now the perfect ink wash is three parts water to one part paint. But if you go too dark, you will ruin the model. So I don't want to ruin my model, so I'm going to do about four parts paint, sorry, four parts water to one part paint. So going a little bit lighter, because I can always go over again. What I can't do is lift off an ink wash I've already put on. Now usually I use my mixing palette for this, which is why it's so black, but because I'm gonna need quite a lot of ink wash, I'm actually gonna use a cup. So I poured in an amount of paint can see that in the bottom. It already had been used for ink wash previously. So I've just put the water in as well. I didn't show that on camera because um, I accidentally left it pointing at the floor. And now I'm going to mix the hell out of it. It's very important to use clean water and not um, your paintbrush water because the um, you know if you do that the impurities in the water will come through because you're doing a very thin paint here. This is a liquid. Now when we're finished mixing, the brush that I mixed with is probably thicker with paint than the actual ink wash is. So this will be darker. So got to bear that in mind and make sure you thoroughly mix it. And that's purely because this had the raw paint in before you started swirling around. So make sure you really, really thoroughly mix this. Now I'm going to put a little bit of the ink wash on the paper and I can see that's looking a little bit thin. Well that's good, I, I want to start thin. So let's not start on the key part of the model. Let's take a little bit of wing, just put some on and make sure it's doing what I expect. And that's looking okay to me. But actually a bit darker than I was expecting, but that's fine. This will look a lot darker than the final model will. As the paint dries and the, uh, the, the water evaporates, you'll be left with um, you know, a, a lighter finished piece. And I'm just going to go over the entire model, absolutely every surface. And it will take a while to, to dry, 
Uh, you'll get pools of ink wash on your painting surface, which is why I've, um, you know, I've, I've put down loads of junk mail. Glossy junk mail works best, by the way. The, um, the, you know, if it's cheap paper, then it just soaks the paint up and goes through onto the table anyway. Um, mind you, this is a painting table. <laughs> it's not exactly the cleanest bit of furniture I own anyway, but uh, you know, I don't want to sort of get crustaceans of paint there making the surface uneven. Now, when you're ink washing like this, and this is where we're up to so far, you need to be uh, careful of any detail work you've done. So I've done a lot of detail work on the faces that I want to keep. So what you can do, any area where you ink wash is applied that you don't want, you can just wet a brush, make it absolutely drenched, and then clear that area off. You can also do it with a bit of um, like kitchen towel or, or tissue paper, what you normally clean your brushes with. Just grab some of that and um, away you go. Now, that side's done. I'm kind of loath to do the back, but at the same time, it's already running to the back. So. I guess the best thing to do is to cover the back and then touch up any areas. Now, I've got a little bit too much ink in these eyes, so I'm going to get actually a dry brush. I'll just lift some of that out. Yeah, let's add some water. So you want to be mindful about where the ink is likely to run down from when the model's at rest. So make sure you clear that out so that it doesn't come into your detail areas. There we go, I just finished ink washing these and that's what they look like at the moment. And I we'll, guess we'll just have to see what it's like when they're dry. I've just washed my hands off. Ink washing is a messy process. This stuff gets everywhere because it's really running, right? Um, so, uh, I've lost count of the number of times in my YouTube videos people say, clean your nails! Because it's the ink wash that does it and there's nothing you can do. So, if you've got a job interview the next day or something, then um, don't ink wash on that day. Seriously, don't. The, uh, the quality of that black paint isn't that high. Um, so the granules are quite large. That's not ideal for an ink wash. I uh, could maybe use a better quality paint for that one, but still, it, it'll look okay. After going to all the effort of painting your miniatures, the last thing you want is for a few years' time for them to end up looking like this, all scratched and, and with the paint worn off. That's one I painted decades ago, and it's been stuffed in a miniatures box, and it wasn't sealed. There are three kinds of sealer. There's a matte sealer, dun dun dun, a satin sealer, which nobody in their right mind uses, and gloss, which I currently haven't got any of. The difference between them is that gloss will shine in the light. So here's a few models that I covered with gloss, and you can see it has a, a specular lighting effect, and I tend to use this on any fish creature, um, like this aboleth and this sahuagin. Everything else I do in matte, with the possible exception of glass, but I'll deal with how to do glass and buildings in a moment. First of all, we've got to douse our models with this stuff. Now, unlike when we're priming, we actually want quite a lot of this on. We want it to be nice and thick, so sometimes you could do on a feature piece, you might do two or three coats of this stuff, just to make sure that it's well protected for the future. When you do this, the model must be dry. So you've got to wait for your ink wash to dry overnight at the very least, because you really cannot afford to have any moisture in the model at this stage. So make sure it's absolutely bone dry. And if you've done any water effects with epoxy or something, too late, you should have sealed first.
I alluded earlier to doing windows and how to do them. It's purely in the sealing process. I use this stuff, varnish gloss, but paint on. So just brush it over the windows and just the windows are specular. It's not as good as spraying it because you know, when you spray something, you did it, it, it more specular than this stuff seems to be. But um, it does at least work, and these are specular lighted. I hope I don't know if that's coming out of this. Girl, maybe I have to play with the light. But anyway, all my windows they shine in the light, which is kind of awesome because windows should. Anyway, that's it from me. That's my tutorial on how to paint. There's a lot more techniques and stuff that you can learn, like how to do marble effects, like on this statue base, and uh, how to do eyes and stuff. And maybe I'll do some videos on that, but um, you know, there are many great crafters on YouTube that can teach you this stuff too. And um, a lot of them are better painters than I am. <laughs> anyway, um, so. This is what we painted in this batch. I uh, hope you liked it. I hope you found some useful tips and tricks. And I'll leave you with some close-up shots. myself and my partner, we knock out videos um, and you know, put them up on YouTube, all full of advice on how to improve your games. But we're a very small channel, very tiny. And like, you know, we're not tiny, tiny, we're not 300 subs tiny. We've sort of get, gotten to that next stage, we've got two and a half thousand subs as I call this. And, um, but, you know, there are many, many bigger, bigger channels that are doing fantastic and we're not one of them. So please subscribe and maybe one day we'll be it's like, you know, have lots of subscribers or something. Because, you know, ego. <laughs> <laughs>